Hello, everyone. Um, hello, Fox Valley Rocketeers and other distinguished guests. I'm Guy Gelhausen, and you're tuned into Thrust Vector Controlled Scale Models. I'm just sitting here thinking I'm glad I'm not traveling this weekend. We're right in the middle of a, a winter storm warning, and the snow is really coming down right now. So, uh, but anyways, glad we're not traveling. A um, couple things before I jump in. Um, chat amongst yourself on the uh, right-hand side of the screen there. And uh, uh, I may or may not be looking at chat, but um, type uh, type your questions in Q&A, and I will do my best to uh, <coughs> excuse me save some time to uh, answer those questions. I'm going to share my screen here. All right. So I was asked to uh, give a talk about um, my uh, Delta Four heavy scale model entrant that was uh, thrust vector controlled. Uh, it was my uh, Narum entrant uh, in sports scale competition this past summer. Um, I'll try to uh, cover, um, this is it actually, on flight day. Um, I'll try to cover uh, how and why this particular <coughs> model was selected and some of the other models I considered uh, other than this, this Delta. I also want to talk a little bit about uh, the thrust vector control system itself. I kind of ran out of time last year and didn't have a much of a chance to uh, cover it. Um, and I also cover some of the trials and tribulations of uh, the testing of this rocket. Um, it is a very tail heavy rocket and it did not like to fly very well um, when I first started uh, boilerplate testing. And in fact, if I hadn't, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Um, if I have time, I will try and cover uh, some of the design and construction techniques I used. Um, used about everything in my toolbox for this one. Um, if any of you watched Joe Barnard's presentation this morning at 10, you might hear some similar terminology and uh, issues uh, since the flight computer I use in this model is basically the baby brother of uh, the AVA computer that he was using to land a model rocket. Mine didn't land, but... Uh, <clears throat> so I was one of those kids that was right in the heyday of the manned space program and the race to the moon and in the heyday of Estes. I had been, I was used to flying these little um, scouts and streaks and they just whoosh up in the sky and they're gone. And until I got a big Bertha, and saw this nice slow liftoff that kind of emulated a real rocket. So I remember going out and buying one of these balsa, turned balsa Gemini capsule nose cones and painting my big Bertha to look like, um, uh, to look like a Titan. So jump ahead <coughs> about 30 years. Um, I guess I'm one of those uh, born again uh, rocketeers, but uh, this is what my family calls uh, the rocket room. And you can get a glimpse of uh, some of the models that I've done uh, over the years, uh, lots of scale models, planes and, and rockets. Um, this few, photo is actually a few years old and what's behind me is really quite different now. I've pr probably done hundreds of scale models. Uh, I really lost uh, count, to be honest with you. Um, from some of the classics I've done two or three times, just at different scales, Redstones, Atlases, Saturns, Titans, Deltas, uh, ballistic missiles, uh, the current uh, heavy lift uh, boosters even. But if you notice, <clears throat> something about all those rockets 
they all have um, they all have clear fins to fly aerodynamically. So uh, a few years ago, uh, I was attending our local NARCON, which is called NERCON. It's kind of a play on words for NI is Northern Illinois. But uh, Ed Chess gave a presentation about uh, competition rocketry and um, scale particularly. And at that time, I, I had absolutely no idea what that was. Um, but um, I uh, left that meeting thinking, you know, maybe I can do that. Um, and then this is where some serendipity comes into play. <clears throat> Excuse me, just about that same time that I had decided to try my hand at competition rocketry, um, the uh, uh, this video uh, became viral, and most of you have probably seen it already, but it's uh, Joe Barnard's uh, Falcon Heavy. And um, it's worth playing again, so you know, so you, if you haven't seen it, um, this, this video completely enthralled me. How in the heck was he doing that? Um, so not to be outdone, by the way, I had to try a night flight of one of my thrust vector control rockets. This is um, this is an F-15 and an E-12. And that is a good six to eight foot flame on that thing. Anyways, Joe's a lot better by a videographer than I am. Um, and uh, so I started following him on, uh, uh, on Twitter and uh, YouTube, and he has a great YouTube channel, by the way, and took a leap of faith, <coughs> excuse me, and bought one of these uh, flight computers. So this is the uh, Signal R2 um, flight computer. Um, there's just a few basic components to it. Um, of course, a processor, an IMU or inertial measuring unit, uh, a barometric altimeter, um, and then all the rest are ancillary connection things. So that's really the heart of the uh, uh, of the thing. And then the uh, thrust vector control gimbal mount um, is just a 3, uh, 3D printed uh, thing with two uh, nine gram servos. So I had this idea of combining uh, thrust vector control and scale models so I could do a project uh, with no clear fins. Um, and altitude and high velocity was not my objective. In fact, uh, just the opposite. I was going to try to fly a solid propellant rocket as slowly as I possibly could and uh, have it still fly. Um, and so before I had, at this point, I had picked my first uh, uh, scale model to do, which was an Atlas V. And I, uh, uh, this is a, a, a graph of the uh, G-forces uh, generated by uh, an F-15 and an E-12. This is before I had started building anything, frankly. I wanted to, at least on paper, see if it theoretically would work. So these lines here are just a graph of the uh, liftoff uh, thrust to weight ratio. And these liquid fuel boost boosters um, leave the pad with a thrust to weight ratio or G forces of just over one. Um, so I was gonna try to fly a rocket similar to that. Um, now, if you know black powder motors, uh, they ha have a big thrust spike at the beginning, which uh, by design, and uh, turns out you actually 
really need those. You need to get the rocket moving and then uh, bleed off that uh, momentum. And so it keeps flying at just uh, at a, a G force is just over one. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is um, actually the, some of the actual flight data that I uh, uh, graphed. Um, it turned out to be quite similar to the predicted. Um, so, uh, so as you know, it worked. So, so I had to. So this next, so that Atlas Five I had done uh, in 2021, and it it flew successfully, but I had to come up with something that was going to um, uh, outdo uh, that one. Um, and I had, I built, uh, an, oh, there's a video there, sorry. Here's a video of it launching. Hopefully those videos are not too glitchy. This is a internet-based system, so they can be a little uh, jumpy or glitchy. But anyway, so that's the Atlas flying uh, there with a single SRB and thrust vector control. So <clears throat> I needed to choose um, a uh, prototype uh, that, again, was uh, a liquid fuel booster. Um, it needed to have an actual mission that had flown. Preferably, it was a rocket that uh, was uh, fairly recent, had a lot of data and dimensions and lots of photographs publicly available. And it, it couldn't be a long skinny rocket because uh, the thrust vector system is uh, <clears throat> uh, sized to fit in a three inch or 75 millimeter airframe. So in other words, if you scale up a little skinny rocket and it turns out to be eight feet tall, you didn't want that either. And I was also looking for a rocket with an interesting backstory, and and probably most of all, it needed to look cool. <coughs> Excuse me. So my um, my first thought was to um, just replace the Centaur upper stage on the rocket I'd already built, the Atlas, um, or convert it to a. Uh, a larger uh, payload fairing, uh, Atlas 541. Um, but I ended up deciding against that. Uh, I really needed to do something different. Now, I have built um, a Falcon Heavy model. It's not thrust vector controlled, but um, that one even had a, a gravity turn to it, unintentional. But uh, uh, but I I ended up not doing that one either because, well, because Joe already did it. So this one um, was kind of a fun rocket. Um, it, it's also a SpaceX uh, rocket. It's uh, it's actually the, uh, the moon lander that was selected by NASA uh, for Artemis. Um, I'm still not quite sure how they're going to find this nice level spot on the moon to land, though, but we'll see. But anyways, this one um, uh, is uh, thrust vector controlled, and it it uh, actually flew fairly well. I did not propulsively land it, but um, uh, it was also built to um, – oops, sorry about that. It was built to have – four um, or th three 13 millimeter um, A-10s in here. I've never flown it that way though, because um, I am afraid to. If one of them didn't light, it would be bad news. So this one, when I posted it on Twitter, kind of went crazy. I got, uh, I literally got likes and views and responses from every corner of the globe, languages I had never seen before. If you hashtag uh, SpaceX, uh, people have a lot of interest in it. This is the first time I really got a feel for the impact that a uh, uh, social media post can have. Um, this one was seriously considered. In fact, if it had actually flown and not been delayed, you probably would have seen this uh, ULA Vulcan uh, Centaur uh, rocket. 
Um, I had built one fairly roughly um, with just um, uh, rigidly attached SRBs, uh, 18 millimeter size here. Um, but it, um, I found out that it didn't fly all that great either, mainly because it was tail heavy, but also um, what happens if uh, all three of those, there's two C6s in there now and one center booster, but if they don't all fire and um, uh, uh, burn out at the same time, you can see it start to get a little squirrely up at the top there. And that's from a staggered burnout of the, uh, the attached SRBs. <clears throat> but anyways, it still hasn't flown, so I couldn't use it in competition. Um, you may see it yet. Um, this one um, is the, uh, of course, the SLS, which actually did just launch. Um, so that one could be in contention for the future. Um, I did build a 1 to 128 scale uh, BT-80 based uh, SLS, and that's it on the left there. And uh, this is just a photograph of the model compared to the uh, uh, a, a 3D rendering. So you could see that one as well in the future. Um, now, this one was a fun one uh, to do, um, and it was in contention uh, up to the last minute. Um, this Rocket Lab, uh, Rocket Lab Electron, it was built to fly with an F10 uh, composite motor, an end burner, which is a long burn uh, uh, composite motor. It has a good thrust spike, but it drops off quickly to under, um, under 10 newtons of thrust. And 10 newtons is not a lot. Uh, it's, uh, you know, 36 ounces. And if you want to fly at a, a thrust to weight ratio at one to one point or one point five, that means the rocket's got to be like twenty eight or thirty ounces, um, twenty five ounces actually, uh, seven hundred, eight hundred grams. So it's a very light rocket. <clears throat> it was built um, out of um, ten mil, uh, ten mil fiberglass, custom fiberglass tubes that I fabricated myself. So the airframe itself is is really quite light, and that F10 it's a it's a cool one to see in person. It just keeps going and going and going for seven seconds. Um, so, uh, but in the end, I I ended up not choosing this one either. Um, I just I didn't think it had enough uh, pizzazz for uh, a competition. Um, this one, unfortunately, uh, still hasn't flown, and probably no one really knows when it will fly. <clears throat> um, I know they're working on it in that big blue building at the south end of Kennedy Space Center, but uh, the uh, this one was one of my favorite ones, actually. It, it looks really cool, um, and it's the real one supposed to propulsively land. Um, that's why the, the fin's on there. But here's a video of it lifting off on an F-15 uh, thrust vector controlled. But as I said, I couldn't use it because uh, it hasn't actually flown. And in competition, the prototype uh, has to uh, actually fly. So after great deliberations, <clears throat> I ended up deciding on this um, Delta IV Heavy particularly the uh, Parker Solar Probe mission. I've been following this one since its launch um, in uh, 2018, and it's still actually an active mission. The Parker Solar Probe is still uh, flying around the sun. <sighs> okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about thrust vector control system and some basics and um, a rocket uh, integration and how it integrates into the uh, rocket. So as I explained before, this is the flight computer itself. <clears throat> Those, um, uh, these mounting rings here are made for a 74 mil, 75 millimeter 
uh, tube. And the um, gimbal unit uh, also made for that size tube. Um, this is one happens to be printed in PLA plastic. I've, um, and this is how it lays out in, in a rocket typically. Um, the thrust vector gimbal unit is obviously near the flamey end and the uh, flight computer is somewhere uh, just above it. It can, it can be anywhere from here up to the nose cone if it needs to be. Um, this gimbal unit is a, is a reprint. Um, generally when these things crash, uh, a three pound rocket comes down pretty hard and they take uh, most of the brunt of the, uh, of the fall. So this one happens to be a, an ABS, white ABS uh, uh, reprint. So this, this is a diagram of, a, uh, of the modes that the flight computer uh, follows and then some of the safety features over here. So the, um, the software is written so that it's the first mode is called pad idle and it's just, uh, this is all ready to fly. It's uh, waiting for a, an acceleration in the z-axis, which is vertical, an acceleration that's uh, equal to or greater than 1.1 um, g or 11 uh, meters per second squared. Um, gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. So if it detects move, movement just over gravity, uh, and just over 1G, then it goes into ascent mode. <clears throat> so in ascent mode, it's ascending, obviously. And then uh, once it detects a rapid change in acceleration, also in the Z-axis, it goes into burnout mode. And typically, the firmware is programmed to, uh, you can either uh, deploy the parachute, fire the pyro at this point, there's other ways to do it with a timer as well. But typically it detects uh, burnout, shuts down the thrust vector system to, to conserve battery power because you just used a lot of current from there to there with those servos going full blast. And then uh, after that is descent mode. Now a couple safety features built in. Um, there's an in-flight abort mode, <clears throat> which... Uh, I've had plenty of those, and I'll show you a few real ones here shortly. But the um, if it, excuse me, if the rocket goes more than 30 degrees out of vertical, which is the um, just the NAR safety rules, so you can't, you're not supposed to launch a rocket more than 30 degrees out of vertical, then it fires the pyro <coughs> um, and uh, deploys the main chute, no matter what's going on, whether it's uh, the engine's still burning or not, and it. It generally will save the rocket and bring it back safely to fly another day. Um, and when you're testing, that's pretty important. You don't have to be rebuild a rocket every day. Um, another safety feature that I uh, use as well is uh, I use a dis one of the other discrete pyro channels to um, include a second pyro if this here doesn't happen and the uh, main pyro does not fire and it just keeps on falling at uh, it's set I have it set for 30 meters or about 100 feet to fire this backup pyro and a chute will come out and um, hopefully save the rocket as long as that parachute deploys uh, before it hits the ground so anyway so that's kind of the modes and um, safety modes of the rocket So one thing about the um, basics, one of the basic concepts of uh, uh, the way rockets um, are steered or how they uh, uh, act is they always uh, rotate about the center of mass or the center of gravity. So no matter where that is, the, the torque uh, is about that center of mass. So if a rocket goes a little bit out of uh, vertical, 
in this line, then the thrust vector control pushes it back and creates torque on it in this direction to counteract it, same in the opposite direction. So the center of gravity is really important um, and how long this moment arm is here from here to the thrust line. Um, if it's very short, you don't have as much control authority as if it's longer. So in an aerodynamic rocket, we're always trying to get the center of gravity forward of the uh, center of pressure, but this is a little bit different way of thinking. It has to do more with the moment arm uh, and ability to uh, uh, control the rocket. So the computer uses <clears throat> what's called PID control logic, which is an acronym for proportional integral and derivative PID. Um, and it's just a continuous control loop that sends commands back to the X and Y servos on the thing at 25 hertz or 25 times a second. It's trying to correct the error, um, and the error is how far the pointy end of the rocket is out of vertical. <clears throat> PID controllers are, and control logic is ubiquitous. It's um, it's all around you um, uh, in many devices. Uh, probably the most common uh, is an automobile uh, speed control or cruise control. And um, it uses obviously velocity or speed as the set point. Um, commercial thermostats use them um, uh, and use temperature as the set point. And uh, the BPS, um, thrust vector control uh, system uses uh, vertical as the set point. So um, when I was trying to understand how this thing worked, I often thought of the analogy of auto the auto cruise, since we're so familiar with that, um, as a way to understand how a PAD controller worked. So on the left is a screenshot of the um, uh, PID values for a, a particular rocket. But um, once you tune it and put in uh, about a half a dozen variables related to that particular rocket, the secret sauce that Joe Barnard came up with is in that firmware um, that uh, calculates appropriate PID values for uh, different rockets. Um, and I think that's, that's where the, the, the um, genius is at in this thing. It, it can be... Um, used for many different types of rockets. Um, again, I'll um, just the, a quick definition of what or how I understand uh, the terms and what they do. Uh, the P stands for proportional. It's just a simple fraction uh, correctional value uh, that it sends, uh, that it adds to the error. Um, if you saw the other one, it was about 30%. Um, but if you only use the P term, you're likely to overshoot and have oscillations. Um, kind of like if you're in the car and you're at uh, 55 uh, miles an hour and you want to get to 60 miles an hour, if you floor it to get to 60, you know what's going to happen. You're going to probably overshoot it. And then if you take your foot off the gas, uh, you're going to undershoot it and same thing over and over again. So that's kind of what's happening there. Now, the I term is an integral. Uh, it's the cumulative error over time. Um, in this, in the case of the uh, these rockets, it uh, uh, corrects uh, for uh, an unavoidable built-in error that you have at launch. Um, you, When you set up these rockets, you have to align the X and Y axis uh, of the gimbal unit as, as vertically as possible. And it's almost impossible to get it perfect. So you're, you know, say off a degree or so. And that I term corrects for that. It also, if you've ever tried to level a, a pad in a, in a cornfield, um, that's pretty hard to, to do. So uh, the I term corrects for that error fairly quickly within the first half second of the flight or so. The D term I think of as the dampener uh, term. Um, it's a uh, the rate of change of the error. How fast is the error uh, increasing or decreasing? And tries to predict um, 
what it's going to do and provides a, a factor, uh, a dampening effect, um, and uh, helps to prevent uh, over abrupt changes, overshoot, and oscillations and things. I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to skip. Um, the thrust vector rocket tuning. So every rocket is unique, and um, you enter uh, six variables uh, measured uh, for each rocket, and then the firmware calculates the PID values from that. Um, the value, the um, variables that you have to enter for your rocket are uh, the mass in uh, kilos, the distance between the center of mass and the thrust vector control thrust line in meters. So that's about 34 centimeters. Uh, you have to do a swing test um, to and the uh, tuner will calculate the inertia of the rocket. So you enter the length of the string that you use to swing the rocket, um, the distance uh, from each string to the center of mass. I usually use an even number, 30 centimeters, so it's easy. Um, and then you swing it and time it, and uh, you get an average rotation time in seconds. And then the last variable is the average thrust. This is an F15, which the average isn't exactly 15. It's actually closer to 14.5. So once you enter those and hit tune, it will give you the PID values. Here's, here's a rocket um, uh, about to have a swing test. Center of mass is about right here, and you swing this and it rotates uh, this way and that way about the center of mass and use a, a stopwatch and uh, time it. So the rocket um, gives you a plethora of data, um, which can be super helpful when analyzing uh, what went wrong or what went right. So the rocket, it, it's logging data at 40 hertz or 40 data points per second. So this is a spreadsheet here that's probably not readable, but um, you can see how much data you get. I happen to have highlighted here the uh, um, uh, G-forces on the Z-axis, the vertical axis, because I want to see how the rockets, uh, uh, the G-forces are, are progressing across the flight. And then this is altitude over here um, that I have highlighted in this particular one. So the data is logged from a flash memory uh, in the um, computer to a micro SD card. Uh, you pull that out, and it's got a CSV, a .CSV format file um, that you just do a save as with an Excel spreadsheet, and you get all this data. I usually am able to correlate fairly closely this data to a slow motion video that I take. In fact, my iPhone set on 240 frames per second, and this data right here are the way I diagnose almost all issues um, with a rock uh, with rockets if they don't fly right. This happens to show a little closer, but it gives you uh, orientation in three axes, uh, acceleration in three axes, the position of the thrust vector gimbal. Um, temperature outside, altitude in meters, altitude in feet, and the uh, mode status that I had mentioned earlier. Here you can, you can tell uh, when the um, uh, SRB burns out or the main motor burns out. So how are we doing on time? 3.34, okay. So the boilerplate testing. Um, I can't tell you how important test flying a boilerplate rocket and getting the bugs out of a scale model is before competition day. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't been doing this uh, very long, only a couple of years, but I, I have seen some awful nice rockets um, not uh, do so well on uh, flight day. And... Um, Anyways, yeah, so a, a boilerplate, flying a boilerplate rocket is really uh, super critical. I mean, I wouldn't be talking to you here if I hadn't worked the bugs out of this uh, 
both the Atlas and this one. Um, for those of you who don't know what is a boilerplate, it's just a term borrowed from the space industry. Um, uh, components, uh, replica components of rockets are, were, were and are built out of uh, quarter inch or three eighths inch plate steel uh, to simulate the mass uh, of, a, of the actual article and then flown in a test flight. And that's that thickness of steel plate is used in boiler pressure vessel. So hence the term boilerplate. Um, so it's really important to build and fly a boiler, uh, boilerplate rocket. And, and the boilerplate should match closely as possible the final model. Um, it's one thing to say you flew a boilerplate. It's another if it, it doesn't match the mass and the location of the center of mass um, to the competition rocket. So these rockets get pretty complex. And early on when I started flying them, I figured out that I needed a checklist after doing some pretty dumb things. Um, so I actually have a two, it's a two-parter. I uh, have the uh, pre-pad checklist that I do everything uh, before I get to the field. And then a number of things that I recheck uh, out in the field. Because uh, just about anything can happen. Uh, I mean, I've had pyros, lows, continuity, um, you name it. Uh, it can happen in the car on the way to the uh, launch pad. But anyways, on competition flight, the only thing you want to be faced with is your own dumb pilot error on that day. Um, so, uh, you, so if you can get all the errors or problems out of it, and then, and when it gets to that day, the only thing that you got to do right is uh, pack the parachutes and hook up the uh, initiators. And as uh, the man Gene Cran said, failure is not an option. So I'm going to show you about um, six or eight test flights here and some of the things that happened uh, in the meantime. I'm gonna, it looks like it's about 3.38. So yeah, we'll get through this and I'll probably have to stop and, uh, um, and, and see what kind of questions uh, uh, we have. So test number one. So this is a boilerplate model that was built before I had finished the design of the final model. And so, some of the positioning of uh, uh, of the computer and things like that, and the battery and the center of mass were not as close to the final model as um, the block two, um, which I'll show you here shortly. But um, but block one um, flew fairly well, at least proof of concept that um, we had enough. Uh, uh, horsepower to with an F-15 and two D-12s to uh, get it flying. Um, and um, I'm using D-12 zeros there. So those uh, SR uh, strap-ons are jettisoning uh, right at burnout of the D-12s. But in this case, what's happening there is the um, uh, one of the aft uh, attach points hung up. And that's an, that was an easy fix. Um, so was able to repair that uh, fairly quickly. So the next test was the same rocket again with some of those uh, things fixed. And um, this was actually a very good flight. In fact, it uh, turned out to be kind of a baseline for later when I could go back and find out why this one flew well and some other ones didn't fly so well. So this one had uh, probably one of the better deployments and separation of the SRBs that I've ever had. The parachutes came down um, almost simultaneously for the two strap-ons and uh, um, the main chute uh, deployed well uh, uh, too. So um, here you can see them coming down um, in fact uh, here. But um, what happened and what the flight data indicated was that the 
burnout mode, the computer was detecting burnout mode when the D12s in the strap-on uh, in the strap-on boosters burned out. So what happens at that point? The firmware is programmed to turn off the TVC system, since uh, to conserve battery power. Now, unfortunately, that was happening at about that jettison was happening about a hundred feet, but it keeps flying another hundred feet before the F15 and the core motor burns out. So I kind of had discovered uh, a deal killer here, and this is. Uh, uh, Fortunately, in November, so I had time, but I got a hold of Joe Barnard, and he was uh, uh, wonderfully gracious and uh, reprogrammed uh, the firmware in both of my flight computers to uh, um, uh, to uh, uh, burn out to uh, detect uh, burnout at or at uh, Apogee, I'm sorry, shut down the TVC at Apogee. So test number three is uh, I was trying a different uh, motor and um, uh, D12, I'm sorry, D12 threes in the, uh, to see if that would work at all uh, in the SRBs. Uh, the three second delay I had kind of was uh, uh, suspect, but um, but what happened was that it was uh, the rocket went horizontal because it was way too heavy to fly with the SRBs still attached, and it just didn't have enough control authority at that point of the thrust curve. Um, it flew kind of cool like an airplane, uh, about 50 yards. Uh, before it uh, uh, fired the uh, main pyro. So what I learned was um, that uh, it's, uh, I couldn't use a three-second delay uh, motor in the uh, uh, strap-on boosters. So test four, now jump ahead to spring, May, middle of May. And um, this is the, over the winter, I rebuilt the uh, 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 rebuilt the boilerplate to more closely resemble the final model, which is uh, being built simultaneously. So by May, mid-May, I'm pretty far along on the uh, uh, competition model as well. But it was not a good flight. Um, it went uh, horizontal. Um, at uh, probably about 75 feet in about one second. So it, it didn't have enough. It was fine when the thrust was high in the thrust spike of the um, F-15, but as soon as that dropped off, it just couldn't, uh, it just didn't have enough control authority. And there you saw an abort with the motor still burning and the parachutes coming out, but it, it came back safely and lived to fly another day. Um, so in fact, the next day, uh, I, uh, wanted to try it again. Um, well, what I had found out is I had a bad, uh, SD card in the other one, so I didn't have any data. So I had to fly it again. Um, but the bad news is that it, uh, did the same darn thing again. It went horizontal, uh, at 65 feet and about 1.2 seconds. And I was uh, starting to get a little uh, worried, uh, actually, at this point. Um, so I was, uh, so I kind of, what I call deal killer number two, I did not, I was not understanding what was going on. In fact, I thought that maybe the rocket was too heavy. Um, I, I wasn't really sure what was happening here. You rocket scientists are probably knowing what's hap what the answer is going to be. But um, so I tried it uh, one more time, even the next day. Um, I tried to eliminate some variables. I uh, replaced the flight computer with my backup. I replaced the gimbal unit. Um, but um, yeah, it, uh, in fact, it even went uh, horizontal even faster. Um, 
so I was um, uh, pretty frustrated at that point. And uh, so three times in a row, basically the same thing happened. Um, so I kind of um, took a step back and, uh, and thought about it for a couple of days. And then the next flight, I, I wanted to eliminate some more variables. So I took the strap-ons off and flew the core only. Um, and it flew better for a while, but as the uh, thrust tapered off on the F-15, it lost control authority. I turned off the abort mode here, by the way, so I could see how it flew. And uh, it's flying horizontal. So, uh, so I was um, uh, pretty, uh, I don't want to say upset, but I was not real happy at this point because I wasn't sure what was going on. So I, I just literally stopped and took a short break and got away from it and went to analyze. Oh, I had flight data now from three bad flights and um, or two, uh, two bad flights anyways, and all the physical attributes of block one and block two boilerplates, what was the difference between them? So I, I literally compared every physical aspect and measurement of the two models um, and uh, flight data uh, together. And I, the, re, the main difference was that the, the distance between the center of mass and the thrust vector thrust line was much longer in the uh, first uh, block one, which flew well. So in other words, it had a much longer moment arm um, thrust being constant. Uh, it was able to impart a much uh, larger moment or a turning moment on the uh, rocket. So this was a, just a graph of three flights with data overlapping. Um, they all are similar enough that it, it wasn't the mo I wasn't short on thrust. Um, but I finally, um, uh, let's see. So I, so I had to, um, dig deep back to my statics and dynamics class and my vector math and, uh, um, figured out that it was simply the fact that the rocket with a very short moment arm here did not have nearly as much control authority as this one, which had a much longer moment arm, a difference of about 150 millimeters or six inches uh, in the two rockets. So with the same force applied, it's sort of like the idea, a long wrench loosens and not better than a short wrench. Um, that's the best way I could describe it. So I moved everything as much as I could up into the payload fairing. And uh, that's the, the battery, the computer, the pyro section, the parachute. So everything that I could was up in this section. And it created kind of an odd um, nose cone, if we will. In fact, the nose cone was glued onto this tube um, because that's actually a, a smooth transition in the real rocket. So this whole section um, blew off, blows off. And I had to make sure that was going to work, which it did. So our, uh, flight test 10 um, with a new block 2B. Uh, I broke this down into two parts. There, there's the ascent here. So otherwise the video is too long. I'm going to have to wrap this up here in just a minute. So flew pretty well. Keeps going, flying. Uh, the core is flying. But one of the problems is, if you see this falling, that is the core. And that is a four letter word in very slow motion. And that's my backup fired at 30 meters, parachute comes out, 
about half that distance, but it saved the rocket to live another day. But what I discovered is that I had bad pyro channels on both my flight computers after ground testing them. So, so this is uh, June 10th, three, four weeks before we got to go to uh, Missouri. And I get, frantically got a hold of Joe Barnard, and he, uh, again, graciously sent me a replacement computer, overnighted it to me, um, and uh, that was what was used uh, at NARA. So this one, uh, I got a post, a nice, uh, a nice uh, response from Tori Bruno even. Uh, I got a, a nice. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty good. Um, but one last test before NARAM, because uh, I, if this flies well, I pull the hardware literally and stick it in the uh, 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 competition model as it is without touching it till it flies in July. So it flew pretty well. The only issue I uh, uh, determined, a small, small issue, was the um, parachutes didn't deploy real well. Uh, on the strap-on boosters. So I built this model real quick and um, tested it, and uh, the rest is history. So that's uh, NARAM. Here we are at NARAM. And just one last video here, and we will wrap it up. So there it is flying. I, people ask me if I programmed in that role um, I did not. It, the rocket had a tendency to, to go broadside into the wind, so it uh, did a nice roll there. So that is it. Um, what's next? I'm working on uh, a um, gimbal unit for smaller motors, uh, uh, 24 millimeter or 18 millimeter and smaller tubes. So my ulterior motive is to make some smaller uh, SRBs or uh, model rockets. So I am going to stop sharing there and come back to this. And uh, we've got some couple Q&A questions. Um, and I've only got about two minutes, unfortunately. So the first, uh, uh oh. Um, question is this won't move. I'm not sure why. Hmm. Uh, guy has taken the first in scale. Page is unresponsive. Okay, so I got a couple minutes. I will try to answer some questions. It crashed there on me. Uh, I may have was the total mass of on the launch pad. So it was about uh, fourteen hundred grams, uh, maybe a little over flight ready with everything. I am having some problems here with. Uh, that um, in this question answer, uh, would love to see a YouTube viewer. Yes, well, um, I'd love to do that. So something is going wrong with my um, 
uh, it keeps giving me an error message. And if I do that uh, and reset it, Sorry, I missed Paul. Uh, my computer crashed. I may, I'll may i answer this, but I don't know if you're still there. Um, how does the ejection charge of a commercial motor interfere with the system? Um, well, there's two things I do. Uh, in competition, uh, I use a plugged casing uh, around the motor and just eject the motor uh, totally uh, with a parachute. And I don't, I use um, uh, booster motors, but they still have a lot of, uh, uh, stuff coming through when the, uh, 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 they break through. Um, so in a, uh, non-competition flight, I plug them with epoxy. <clears throat> Robert, guy has taken first in scale the past two NARAMs. Not bad for a rookie. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> what level of control do you have over the PID gains? Um, they are, uh, infinite from zero to one. So um, it seems BPS TVC has been sold out for a long time. Any insight on that? Yeah, I asked Joe about it today. He said he tried to uh, uh, hire someone to uh, manufacture them uh, and it didn't work out. There probably is some of it. I wouldn't be surprised that people have bought them and they're on eBay, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, Robert, how did your NARA model place? It ended up in first place. Uh, love the rocket collection behind you. Thanks. Yes. So I think that's it. And I'm going to stop the broadcast. <clears throat>